This is a homily for the sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time. The first reading is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and verses 45 and 46. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. Let's begin by seeing where we now are in Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel begins with a brief prelude of 13 verses. That is followed by an account of Jesus' ministry in the Galilee region. Jesus and the disciples then begin the journey to Jerusalem for the celebration of Passover. Mark then gives us a day-by-day account of of the final week in the life of Jesus, beginning with his entry into the Holy City on Palm Sunday and culminating with the women finding the empty tomb and being told by an angelic messenger that Jesus has been raised. Today's Gospel, from chapter 1, is set during Jesus' Galilean ministry. The season of Lent begins during this coming week. Ash Wednesday falls on February the 14th. So with today's liturgy, we say farewell to the Sundays of ordinary time until June the 9th. The last week of Lent is known as Holy Week, which begins on Palm Sunday. And it culminates with the celebration of Easter, which this year falls on March the 31st. Easter is always celebrated on the first Sunday following what is known as the Paschal Full Moon. The Paschal Full Moon is the first full moon on or after March the 21st. This explains why the date of Easter can fall anywhere between March the 21st and April the 25th. This year, the full moon falls on March the 25th in the Northern Hemisphere, so Easter falls on Sunday, March the 31st. Pentecost Sunday is the last day of the Easter season, and we then recommence ordinary time. However, on the two Sundays following Pentecost, we celebrate two major feast days, the Solemnities of the Most Holy Trinity and the Most Holy Body and Blood of Christ. That means that it won't be until June the 9th that we resume celebrating the Sundays of Ordinary Time, continuing with Mark's account of Jesus' Galilean ministry. Today, on this sixth Sunday of Ordinary Time, we're still reading from chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel. Jesus has called his first disciples. He cast out an unclean spirit from a man in the synagogue at Capernaum, and he then healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law of fever. Today, he heals a leper. Keep in mind the setting of Mark's Gospel. This world is enemy-occupied territory. An evil power has made itself, for the present, the prince of this world. The world as a whole is the house of the strong one, Satan's territory. In Mark's worldview, physical illness is no less a mark of the rule of Satan than overt demonic possession. William James, the American psychologist and philosopher, speaking at Columbia University, once characterized our modern age using one German word. He said that we were today the victims of Zerissenheit. It means torn apartness. That is a perfect description of the chaos created by Satan and his cohorts. So when Jesus heals this man, he makes his world whole once more. God's reign brings healing and wholeness into a world fragmented and torn apart by sin and sickness. 
in casting out an unclean spirit, in healing a woman of fever, and healing a leper, Jesus is heralding the coming of God's rule. A regime change is at hand. Let's now consider the healing of this leper in closer detail. We're told that a leper approaches Jesus. Jesus feels sorry for him, stretches out his hand and touches him. This is the only time in Mark's Gospel that Jesus heals a person with leprosy. So, a leper approaches Jesus. Keep in mind that each Sunday, the lectionary selects a first reading to complement the theme of the Gospel. Today's first reading, quite appropriately, comes from the book of Leviticus. We read there, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, If a swelling or scab or shiny spot appears on a man's skin, a case of leprosy of the skin is to be suspected. The man must be taken to Aaron the priest, or to one of the priests who are his sons. A man infected with leprosy must wear his clothing torn and his hair disordered. He must shield his upper lip and cry, Unclean! Unclean! As long as the disease lasts, he must be unclean, and therefore he must live apart. He must live outside the camp. The word translated here as leprosy is zararat in the Hebrew Bible, or lepra in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. Lepra is also the word used in today's Gospel. The Jewish Study Bible makes a number of important points about this disease. Firstly, the disease called leprosy, Hansen's disease, was not known in biblical times, and the description given in the Bible is not consistent with it. Zararat cannot be identified with a single pathology. The distinctive symptom of Zararat in humans, is scale-like eruptions of the skin. Lacking modern microbiology, the Bible referred to conditions with similar outward manifestations by the same name. Zararat afflicts not only humans, but also fabrics and building materials. In fabrics and building materials, it refers to various types of mildew, Those having zararat, or abnormal genital fluxes, are considered to be impure. Zararat was seen as a gradual erosion of the skin, and was thought to culminate, unless the patient recovered, in the ultimate disintegration of the flesh, which was taken as a manifestation of the gradual escape of life. The person afflicted with it was looked upon as potentially dead, death itself having begun to consume his body. This leakage of life creates impurity. The person is quarantined. The quarantine is not aimed at arresting the spread of the disease, but is an attempt to contain the spread of an intolerable amount of severe impurity in case Zararat is present. Let's look at two contemporary Jewish translations of the text from Leviticus. Firstly, the Jewish study Bible. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a person has on the skin of his body a swelling, a rash, or a discoloration, and it develops into a scaly affection of the skin of his body, it shall be reported to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priests. Note that the Hebrew word zararat is translated as scaly affection. Secondly, Robert Alter's translation of the Hebrew Bible. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Should a person have on the skin of his body an inflammation or a rash or a shiny spot, 
and it becomes the affliction of skin blanch on the skin of his body, he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons the priests. Alter translates the Hebrew word zararat as skin blanch. Alter points out that throughout the rather long section in the book of Leviticus on dermatological disorders, the precise identification of disease and even symptom remains uncertain. So we're not exactly sure precisely what skin condition this man had, but we can be reasonably sure that it wasn't leprosy, that is, Hansen's disease. Notice one word that is associated with Zararat. That is the word impurity. The English words pure and impure may create the impression that we're talking about personal hygiene. In other words, pure means clean and impure means dirty. Or it might suggest that pure and impure are being used in a metaphorical sense. So impure means wicked or bad and pure means righteous or good. However, such suggestions are wrong. Purity and impurity in the Hebrew Bible mean neither of these things. In the book of Leviticus, for the most part, sin is not the cause of impurity, and righteousness is not synonymous with purity. That is why it would be more precise to talk about ritual purity and impurity. The Bible does not give us a theoretical definition of purity and impurity, nor any indication as to why the state of impurity is undesirable or harmful. The Encyclopedia Judaica makes a number of points about ritual purity and impurity. Firstly, Ritual purity and impurity is a concept that a person or object can be in a state which by religious law prevents the person or object from having any contact with the temple or its cult. The state is transferable from one object to another in a variety of ways, such as touching the object or being under one roof with it. The state of impurity can be corrected by the performance of specified rituals, mainly including ablution, after which the person or object becomes pure once more until impurity is again contracted. The purity of a person with a zararat is dependent upon that person's complete recovery. Whether or not a person has recovered must be decided by a priest, which is why Jesus tells the man that he cures in today's gospel to go and show himself to the priest and to make the offering for his cleansing as prescribed by Moses. Zararat was the most dreaded of all diseases because it separated people from family and community and thus constituted a living death. Rabbinic sayings compare the cure of Zararat to raising the dead. The concept of purity and impurity is by no means exclusive to the Jewish religion. Indeed, it was a central and integral feature of most, if not all, ancient religions. In the Bible, the main source for biblical laws of purity and impurity is Leviticus, chapters 11 to 17, and the book of Numbers, chapter 19. In addition to the Bible, the laws of ritual impurity and purity are explained, defined, and extended in the halakha, that is, the normative law or practice as defined by the rabbinic sages in the Mishnah and other works. The three main causes of ritual impurity are zararat, sexual discharge from either a man or a woman, dead bodies of certain animals and particularly human corpses. 
in one way or another, these all involve a leakage of life. Today's first reading from the book of Leviticus makes it clear that anyone with this condition must live apart. They must live outside the camp. In defiance of this prescription of the law, the man approaches Jesus, and Jesus stretches out his hand and touches him. New Testament scholar Joel Marcus alludes to the implication of Jesus touching the man. This skin disorder was treated as a grave anger to the cultic purity of the community in ancient Israelite religion and in later Judaism. Sufferers were regarded as, in effect, corpses, and physical contact with them produced the same sort of defilement as touching dead bodies. But Jesus is not defiled. He does not catch impurity by touching the man. On the contrary, the man catches healing and wholeness from Jesus. This condition not only afflicted the body, it also thwarted this man's deepest longings. It banished him from his people, making him an outcast, as we hear in today's first reading. What is happening here is quite clear. Jesus is welcoming an outsider, and thereby restoring him to family and friends. In this man's case, the barrier that ostracized him and the barrier that crumbled at Jesus' command was Zararat. Today's Gospel invites us to reflect upon other barriers in our world that must also crumble. Those barriers can be racial. Soon after Australia became a federation in January 1901, the federal government passed the Immigration Act of 1901. The passage of this bill marked the commencement of the White Australia policy. It was only in 1975 that the Australian government passed the Racial Discrimination Act, which made racially based selection criteria illegal. Within Australia, there were also more subtle forms of discrimination. In 1908, for example, the Committee of the Royal Sydney Golf Club recognised that the feeling of the club is averse to the admission of Jews, and no Jew became a member of the club for the next 75 to 80 years. In the modern state of Israel, the boundary between Israel and the Palestinian West Bank is a very real boundary. Commenced in 2002, this huge wall extends for 760 kilometres and is designed to keep Palestinians out of Israeli territory. In Fratelli Tutti, an encyclical letter on fraternity and social friendship, Pope Francis makes this observation. Once more we encounter the temptation to build a culture of walls, to raise walls, walls in the heart, walls on the land, in order to prevent this encounter with other cultures, with other people. And all those who raise walls will end up as slaves within the very walls they have built. Let's return to today's Gospel. We're told that Jesus feels sorry for the man. That is the translation of the Jerusalem Bible. The revised New Jerusalem Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, and the New American Bible all have moved with pity. The New International Version has filled with compassion. And Tom Wright's translation tells us that Jesus was deeply moved. The verb used in the Greek text of the Gospel is splachnizomai. The noun splankna includes the heart, lungs, liver and intestines. So the verb conveys the idea that a person is really churned up inside. In classical Greek, it refers to the seat of the deepest emotions. 
So Splachnizomai describes an emotion that moves a person to the very depths of his or her being. It is the strongest word in Greek for the feeling of compassion. So a translation that captures the intensity of this verb might be, he was moved to the very depths of his being. It's interesting to note that a Greek-speaking pagan at the time of Jesus would have found it completely, totally and utterly incredible to use this word about anyone who was divine. According to the Stoics, for example, the supreme and essential characteristic of God is apatheia. That's the Greek word from which we get our English word apathy. But the Greek word apatheia doesn't mean apathy in the modern sense. It refers to total incapability of feeling. The Stoics argue this way. If you feel happiness, anger, joy, hatred, jealousy, disappointment, or indeed any emotion, that means that someone else has the power to affect you. That person has power over you, at least for the moment. If God had any emotional feelings about human beings and what happens to them, that means that human beings have the power to affect God, and therefore that they have power over God, at least for the moment. It is impossible that anyone could have power over God, for no one can be greater than God. Therefore, God can have no feelings. God is essentially without feeling. God is therefore apathetic in the technical sense of the word. Jesus, however, is moved to the very depths of his being. Australian Cistercian monk Michael Casey makes this observation. True compassion is not condescending, but infinitely embracing. It is not flinching from ugliness, mistakes or mess, but seeing underneath external appearances the reality of our common humanity. This is how Christ responds to us, and he bids each one of us go and do likewise. Let us return to another important point in today's Gospel. The leper came to Jesus and pleaded on his knees. The Greek text uses three present participles, parakalon, which means beseeching or pleading, gonupeton, which means kneeling down or falling to his knees, and legon, which means saying. And what does he say? He utters a moving profession of trust in Jesus. If you want, you can make me clean. In the Greek text, Jesus replies in two words, thelo, meaning, I am willing, and the imperative, katharisthetai, meaning, be made clean. New Testament scholar Rowan Williams makes this observation. Jesus will perform miracles out of compassion, out of an awareness of human solidarity, we could say. But on the other side of this is that he will require trust or belief from those with whom he works. Trust heals people. Jesus' healings are always bound into a relation between him and the person to be healed. Miracles of healing require a relationship, require someone to put his or her trust in Jesus. Out of that meeting of trust and compassion comes the miracle. Later in the Gospel, in chapter 6, when Jesus, who is now living in Capernaum, returns to his hometown of Nazareth and preaches in the local synagogue, we're told that he was amazed at their lack of faith. Rowan Williams explains... In the story about his visit to his hometown, the reason he can't do mighty works there is, it's implied, that people don't trust him. They remember him as a local labourer. They know his family. 
the relation is one of casual familiarity and a bit of contempt or snobbery. They cannot trust him to be different, to be himself. But as we have seen, it's made very clear in several of the healing stories that miracles of healing require a relationship, require someone to put his or her trust in Jesus. Today's Gospel invites us all to join the leper at the feet of Jesus and pray, If you will, you can make me clean. But there's one final point. Why are many people who put their trust in Jesus not healed? When Jesus says, I will, he shows that he has the power to heal even the most dreaded diseases. Thelo, I will. This word, which is grace to the leper, is also good news to the reader. God wills healing. Why then does he not always heal those who in faith seek his healing touch? Today's gospel affirms the power of Jesus. I will. But keep in mind that Jesus himself at prayer in Gethsemane prior to his arrest made a prayer reminiscent of the lepers. Abba, Father, for you everything is possible. Take this cup away from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Here we find that same word again, Thelo, I will. The healing of the leper must be interpreted finely in the light of Jesus' own submission to the will of God. Not my will, but yours.